when 25-year-old Linda Scavana gets lost in the Grand Canyon. Her dream holiday turned into a living nightmare. I was starting to panic, and I wasn't thinking real clearly. It was very, very scary. For over 20 days, she must battle hunger, dehydration, and the extremes of the mighty Grand Canyon in a desperate bid to stay alive. I remember thinking, if I could maybe just die in my sleep, that would be the most peaceful way to go. Twenty-five-year-old Linda Scavana is preparing to set off on an epic solo driving trip. I had three weeks vacation from work. It was definitely an escape, just a time to, to get away from the, the stresses of everyday life. A student nurse from Pittsburgh, Linda is heading off across the length of America a trip that she hopes will satisfy her sense of adventure. I was kind of a rebel at times, my own idea about things. You know, when you're young and 25, <laughs> the world doesn't seem so dangerous. I just wanted to see America. My plan was to drive six to eight hours a day and then find a, a campground, pitch a tent and uh, sleep and then set out early the next morning. And to keep her company on the trip, she's brought her best friend, pet dog, Coco Jin. That way. It was the first pet that I had ever had as a puppy. We were very, very attached. <laughs> Definitely my child, my baby. Linda spends two weeks traveling over 2,000 miles across the country. But before she heads home, she wants to make the trip extra special with a final hike into the mighty Grand Canyon. One of the places that I wanted to visit because it's one of the natural wonders of the world. The Grand Canyon is known as an epic tourist destination, but it's also a popular place for hiking. Come on. Before she heads off into the canyon, Linda stops off at a local store to buy postcards and let her family know that she's fine. On one of the postcards, I saw a set of waterfalls. And I thought, oh, you know, I'd like to see those. But I wasn't sure where you leave and what kind of a hike it was. Do you know if there are any organized tours to the waterfalls? Uh, no organized tours as such. If you drive up to the hilltop campsite, you can make your way down to the Supai village, and the falls are right down there. OK, that's good. Thanks. So I, I wrote my postcards up. And I recall all sending one off to my brother and sister-in-law. To get to the waterfalls, Linda and Coco Jin must first drive to a staging post at the beginning of the hike. I didn't know that it would take me as long as it did because it was, I think, maybe about 35 miles. 
but it was all dirt road, so it took me a couple of hours to get through that and to finally get to the hilltop. By the time they get there, it's already lunchtime. It's late in the day to be setting off on a hike. But undeterred, Linda heads off into the valley. Yes, I was overwhelmed by the, the, the size and the enormity of it. It made me feel small. It's eight miles to the waterfalls near the Supai Indian village, where Linda plans to spend the night, then head back to her car in the morning. The heat makes hiking slow, and after a few miles, the trail becomes hard to follow. By mid-afternoon, Linda is still miles from the Supai village. I heard sound behind me, and when I looked around, I saw that it was this, a mule train. And I think I had read something to the effect that that's how all the, the food and how their mail is transported down into this Indian reservation. The dog started barking, and I was concerned because I knew that, you know, this was the Indians' territory, and I didn't want to cause any problems, so we held up and I let them ride on by. But as the afternoon draws on, the trail appears endless. As I kept walking, I noticed that the sun was starting to go down. With the light beginning to fade, Linda knows she has to get to the Indian village before nightfall. And as she reaches the end of the trail... There was a sign. You can make your way down to the Supai village and the falls are right down there. But the sign was not well marked. I didn't know whether or not to make a right or a left. One way leads towards the waterfalls and the safety of the Indian village. The other, out into the vast wilderness of the Grand Canyon. For some reason, I made a right-hand turn. Thinking she's heading towards the village, Linda heads off with Coco. But after yet another hour of walking, there's still no sign of life. At that point, I was beginning to feel that I should probably be close by. Coco! With night approaching, Linda knows that it's too late to go back to the junction and try the left-hand turn. She has no option but to keep going. If she doesn't make it to the Indian village before dark, she'll be stranded in the middle of nowhere. In the canyon, nighttime comes very quickly because of the, the walls. It would be pitch black down there, and I wouldn't be able to see. As I kept hiking and the sun was going down, that became a major concern. Linda's backpack weighs over 20 pounds and is slowing her down. I knew I could make better time without it because it was beginning to feel very heavy on my back. 
Ditching the backpack will mean leaving behind her sleeping bag, food, and only supply of water. I would have nothing except, you know, the clothes that I had on my back and a few items that I had in my purse. With no experience of being out in the wild, Linda makes a terrible decision. I thought I could always come back for it the following morning. My priority at that point in time was just to make it to the Indian Reservation, make it somewhere safe before dark. Hello! But as night falls, Linda and Coco are just tiny specks in the vast canyon floor. Is anybody there? Yeah, I was totally alarmed with getting dark and not being where I needed to be. That was my realization that I wasn't on the right trail. And with the light fading, Linda has no chance of retracing her steps to her backpack. You start thinking about the worst sort of things that can happen. Help! And just kind of overcome by fear. The first night was devastating. It was very, very scary. You just can't see, you know, other than the, the stars that are out. There's no artificial lighting of any kind. As the temperature on the canyon floor plummets, Linda is totally unprotected against the cold. In my backpack, I had my uh, sleeping bag, and I had all my food supply and my water. In the pitch black night, it's impossible for Linda to find her backpack. So without that, I really had nothing to protect me from the elements and nothing to sustain me. Her only source of comfort is her best friend, her pet dog, Coco Jin. Kokujin just stayed by me. I was thankful to have him because we could cuddle up with one another and you know he would offer some warmth. I cried off and on, I think, the entire night, just out of fear and not knowing what was going to happen to me. The next morning when the sun came up, because I had wandered around, I wasn't really sure where I was. I wasn't oriented. During the night, Linda wandered off the trail and has now lost her bearings in the maze of the Grand Canyon Valley. She's completely stranded in 2,000 square miles of barren wilderness. Linda has no option but to keep looking for a trail that will lead her to her backpack and out of the canyon to safety. But nothing looks familiar. As I would follow trails, they would just lead nowhere. It's very difficult to see any kind of distance because there's all these little side canyons and walls and you're like a rat in a maze. I kept hoping that I would see someone, which I never did, or that I would see a, a low-flying plane, but nothing. After hours of walking, all she can see is the relentless monotony of the canyon wilderness. I did a lot of hollering and screaming, just hoping that someone would hear, especially, you know, in those canyons, because noise can carry. Help! 
By mid-afternoon, the temperature in the canyon rises to over 100 degrees. And neither Linda nor Coco Jin have had a drop to drink in nearly 24 hours. I remember getting very, very hot. I was thirsty and I had nothing to eat or drink. My mouth was just terribly, terribly dry. In these conditions, human beings need around two gallons of water a day. My nurse's training told me that I needed to have water, that there was no way I was going to be able to survive without water. I knew I could live without food, um, but the water was going to be essential because it's so hot during the day down there. And I guess real fear set in at that point. Coco. If I had been completely alone, without the dog, I think I would have fallen apart. Tired? He's here right now. I would talk to him. <laughs> I'm sorry I got you into this, Coco. <laughs> but we'll find our way out, you know, trying to keep positive. But by early evening, Linda realizes she and Coco Jin are still completely lost within the vast wilderness. I knew I was going to be down there another night. Somebody! I think it was Somebody. on that second night a little harder than, than the first night because by that time I, I realized that there was something terribly wrong. <laughs> I don't think that I was as hopeful in regards to finding my way out. I think I was <laughs> leaning more towards the fact that maybe someone was going to have to find me. Day three, I knew it was Monday, and I said, well, you know, I survived the weekend down here. Uh, but I still knew I had to find water. Every year, around four people die of dehydration in the canyon. In this heat, Linda will be lucky to survive another day without water. My nose and my mouth and my skin was just very, very dry. Linda is desperate to find a water source. But in the dry and arid Grand Canyon, they are few and far between. But late on the third day, she sees her first glimpse of hope. In front of me, I could see that it was dripping. It was almost like, is it real? I wasn't certain if it was truly there. So I walked up all the way, and sure enough, it was moist, and the dog started lapping up water. Linda has found a lifeline, a tiny desert spring. I looked up to see where the water was coming from, and it was like 15 feet above my head, just coming out of rocks. But the water is trickling down agonizingly slowly. I was then thinking, well, how am I going to be able to gather up this water? And so I, I looked through my purse. I did have this little plastic eyeglass case. It was one of the few items that was in my purse that was of any worth to me. I thought, well, if I could get that set up in between the uh, small rocks, 
then after a period of time, I would be able to collect enough to get a cup that I could actually drink. It probably took an hour or so to maybe get like a cup of water. When your mouth is just so dry and you can barely talk and then to have the moisture of the water and just knowing that that was gonna possibly save my life, just sheer joy. The drips supplied just enough water to allow Linda to regain her strength. I knew that it was gonna be important for me to stay there to kind of like regroup and recover a little bit. Because my feet were swollen and I had blisters on them and um, I was just exhausted. Finding the tiny water supply has given Linda hope. But the next day, she looks in her diary and makes a devastating discovery. I was due back on the 13th of August, so I knew I had at least another 10 days, a week and a half, before anyone would actually realize that I was missing. In her last postcard home, Linda told her family she was well and having a great time. No one knows she's missing. If she's to have any chance of survival, the independent spirit that brought her here alone is going to have to get her out. Now able to collect a few mouthfuls of water, Linda decides to hike away from the spring in search of a trail out of the canyon. My new plan was to drink as much water as I could before I would set off that day so I would be hydrated and then follow a trail and see where it would possibly lead to. As long as I can retrace my steps and get back to my water supply, because I knew that that was paramount. For five days, Linda searches north, south, east, and west of her base. But each day ends in crushing disappointment. I may feel up in the morning um, with big plans to follow a trail and hope that that would lead me out, only to be devastated that it didn't lead anywhere and I wasn't going to get out that day. Linda is trapped in the endless maze of the canyon. And she starts to believe she will never escape. I was just totally depressed. Throughout the ordeal, only her mental strength has kept her going. She has survived 12 days without food and very little water. And now her body is beginning to wither away. It's not like the hunger you go through, like if you've missed a meal or a couple meals, uh, where you get that gnawing sensation in your stomach. Um, that had come and gone. 
Having used up all of its fat reserves, her body is now eating itself away. I, I knew that I was losing weight just the way that my clothes were hanging on me. And I had a belt that I would have to adjust every couple of days so my pants would stay up. So I knew that the lack of food was, was taking a toll on my body. Without food, her meager water supply and the companionship of Coco Gin are the only things keeping her alive. Coco, no! But when Coco knocks over two hours worth of carefully collected water, it's too much for Linda to bear. Stupid dog! I was annoyed, and I hollered at him, and he knew I was angry with him. Frightened by her outburst, Coco disappears into the canyon. I kind of felt guilty. Coco! Terrified at the prospect of being left alone without her best friend, Linda is desperate to find Coco Gin. Coco! But Coco Gin is nowhere to be seen. Coco! It gradually dawns on Linda that she might never see him again. I thought maybe once I got back there that night, he'd be, be waiting there for me. almost as if I had, had driven him away. Coco! And by mid-afternoon, <laughs> it's clear he's gone for good. I was devastated. My one only companion that I had down there. I was completely alone. After 11 freezing nights out in the wilderness, a violent storm blows into the canyon. I built a shelter for myself in between two rocks that came out of the sand, and then I took some of the, the shrubbery around and built a little roof on top. But the makeshift shelter does little to keep off the torrential rain and provides no defense against the predators lurking in the undergrowth. As I was trying to fall asleep, I heard some rustling. I became alert and threw a handful of sand in the direction that I thought I heard the sound. And then I heard a hissing sound. Fearful of deadly rattlesnakes hiding in the bush, Linda is forced to abandon the shelter. It was one of the toughest nights. There was thunder and lightning and a lot of rain, and it was very frightening down there because I didn't have any shelter. I was out in the open. It was definitely cold, and, and definitely that was a concern, the hypothermia. Alone, miles from civilization, Linda knows she must find the mental strength to survive. I started to think of ways to occupy my mind, and I said a rosary, and then I started to sing songs, just something to keep me occupied, to get me through that night.
Linda has been making daily hikes away from her base to try to find a way out of the canyon. But she can only venture an hour from her water supply before thirst drives her back. I was trying to go under some of the rock hangings in order to, to keep cool. It was underneath one of those rock hangs that I noticed the bottle. The bottle is a glimmer of hope. This was something portable that I could carry water in and, and go out and hike even further away from my main water source. Linda knows that finding the bottle might just save her life. If she can fill it with water, she can travel further than ever before and maybe find a way out of her ordeal. It was a process of hours to, you know, get the plastic eyeglass case filled with water and transfer it into the vodka bottle. For the first time in 13 days, Linda sees a chance of escape. With the bottle full of water, Linda leaves the camp with no intention of returning. This time, she plans to just keep on going as far as she can. I was in a positive mood that day because I was feeling bound and determined that I was gonna get out. The realization hit me that I wasn't gonna just lie down and give up. I was just 25 years of age and I had so much life to live yet. I had so much more that I wanted to experience. To give up was just, it wasn't an option at that point. My will to live was greater. But after two whole days of wandering, she's still trapped on the floor of the valley, unable to see above the sheer rock faces. I thought that if I could climb up higher on some rocks that I could get a better view and perhaps see where I needed to go. Climbing the rocks is dangerous, but it's her only chance of being able to see a possible way out. I risk falling and you know, breaking an ankle or something like that. I didn't realize how weak I was because of the lack of food. My coordination wasn't as good as it normally would have been. I was looking for handholds and footholds. Plus, I had this purse hanging off me with the water bottle in it, so I was trying to be careful of that, too. In an instant, Linda's vital water supply is gone. Now she has nothing to sustain her in the searing heat of the Grand Canyon. I was quite upset with myself and then thinking that, well, now what do you have? You're away from your water source and now you've dropped the only bottle of water that you had and um, kind of back to square one again. <laughs> Even though I had lost the bottle of water, I was still determined to get up to the top of this rock so that I could get a better view. 
But when Linda finally reaches the top of the plateau, she realizes her efforts have been in vain. I couldn't get much better view than I really had when I was on the canyon floor. The area is just vast, just all these little side canyons and really nothing suggesting any kind of civilization and just numerous rock formations, not any kind of landmarks that you could pick out. For the first time in days, Linda discovers she's not alone in the canyon. Seeing those wild horses, I thought, well, if there's animals down here, where are they getting their water? The other hopeful thing was that if there's horses, then maybe there would be men that were hurting them or whatever. In the barren landscape, this sign of life gives Linda renewed faith. I mean, you start thinking strangely, perhaps I could even <laughs> get a hold of one and <laughs> ride it on out of the canyon. <laughs> but um, I realized that was probably very unrealistic <laughs> because you could only get so close to them and then they would run off. So I couldn't get probably within maybe 50 feet of them, if even that. Once more, Linda is alone. But following the horses has led her to a welcome sight. I noticed pools of water. And I remember looking at it and seeing little insects or whatever um, swimming around in it. And I thought, well, I don't really have any other choice except to, to drink it because I see any way I'm going to survive. The water was kind of bitter, but it was wet and I knew it would uh, get me through another day. As night falls, Linda drifts in and out of consciousness and is haunted by nightmares and fear. I had started having dreams of, of animals coming and uh, eating out my eyes. Now seriously malnourished, Linda is starting to fantasize about an end to her hunger. I began thinking about food quite a bit. And so I would kind of just sit there on a rock, you know, and, and think about um, dinner menus, writing those out in my journal. Spare ribs and potatoes au gratin, tossed salad and cauliflower with hollandaise sauce. So kind of vicariously, I was <laughs> eating through my, my menus that I would write. I was sitting there resting, and I decided that I was going to brush my hair. <laughs> for what purpose, I wasn't sure. Almost three weeks after getting lost, Linda finally hears the sound she's been yearning for. I can hear the, the wings going around, and, um, and I knew it was close. Back in Pittsburgh, when Linda fails to arrive at work, 
her family finally realizes she's missing. And prompted by the postcard she sent them, they've triggered an aerial search of the canyon. It seems her ordeal is finally over. But Linda is impossible to see from the air. It was devastating that they didn't see me, but I could figure out why. Linda realizes that if she can't be seen from the air in the vast canyon, the chances are she'll never be found. Linda's brother and sister-in-law have now joined the search. But when they arrive at the campsite that Linda began her hike from, they're greeted with a sight that fills them with foreboding. That's her car, right? Yeah. Linda's car has been broken into, but is still exactly where she left it almost three weeks ago. We were told that there was virtually no chance that Linda would be alive if she were lost in the, the canyons. Um, there wasn't much chance we could even find her body. We were on a gruesome kind of mission. The scary part was that all the canyons looked the same and they're not marked by anything except for an occasional old wooden sign. They arrive at the same sign where Linda mistakenly turned right and out into the wilderness. Which way do you think? I don't know. Will I canyon? This way. Maybe. Linda's brother and sister-in-law turn left towards the Supai village and away from where Linda remains stranded in the canyon. I was afraid for Linda. The chance of survival after being lost in a place like that just seemed so remote. Mentally and physically exhausted, and dangerously dehydrated, Linda finally gives up all hope of ever getting out alive. Now, death is her only way out. My priority was to find a place where I could just fall asleep and then hopefully die in my sleep. I thought, this is probably going to be it. I remember lying down and thinking, if I could maybe just die in my sleep, well, that would be the most peaceful way to go. I thought, you know, if I don't make it out of here, my parents will never really know what happened. My mother had lost a brother, her baby brother. And, you know, here's a woman that had gone through a lot of trauma in her younger years. And to me, that was, that was kind of devastating to think that they would be going through that. After 19 days battling to stay alive, Linda finally gives up.
I heard voices. And it was almost like, is it a figment of my imagination or, or is it for real? Four Native Americans from the local village had noticed footprints in an area where tourists don't venture, and using traditional tracking methods, have managed to locate Linda in the vast canyon. You could tell by the looks on their faces that they were kind of amazed to find me alive. It was just joyous. And waiting for her in the nearby Indian village are her brother and sister-in-law. She looked wonderful and she looked horrible. She was skeletal looking and she was the color of bricks from the canyon soil. It was just very emotional. It was the best feeling in the world. The three of us just grabbed each other and put our heads together and just howled, really. You know, the tears just flowed. But then, for Linda, the best surprise of all, the locals have also found Coco Jin, wandering lost amidst the canyon. That was a happy reunion, too. Yeah, yeah I was very happy. There was a lot of things that I didn't do correctly, a lot of things, and I, to this day, can't figure out why. Um, with all the, the big mistakes that I made, you know, how I was able to survive. Despite her ordeal, Linda made a full recovery and went on to get married and raise a family. I just didn't think it was my time, my time to go. And uh, that, stayed with me and uh, the, just the, the persistence and the, the, the will, the strong will to survive.